Hello and welcome to Glaswegian Geeks. Today we are doing a follow-up from Tim Burton's Batman with, funnily enough, you know, the sequel to the movie, Batman Returns. No way. Who'd have thunk it? Batman has well and truly returned. All over this, sequel. this um, movie. Anybody can say what they want about this film. I personally think that it's one of the best sequels ever made. Um, I'm going to be honest. Oh, best sequels ever made? As in all the movies and all the sequels? Yeah. Wow. You know how wow. you, you know what I mean? Based on, you know, you know, based on what it was yeah, for the time. Yeah, you know oh, I mean? I. And I mean, this was a film that genuinely aspired to be even madder than the first so you definitely know, at the time people were sort of like what the fuck so batman returns i think it, it upped its game and it, it really definitely upped its game multiple villains as as every good comic book sequel will have multiple villains equals mere fun well yes and especially when the two villains are a villain who is an a-grade villain yes but usually acts like a B-grade villain. You know, he's very political, so they really changed that. Um, if you've never seen it, treat yourself. It uh, is definitely. Sh- sheer madness, and it's just great fun. But the two villains in this film who take, head, uh, who take you know, who take the, the spotlight are Catwoman and... Penguin. Penguin. Two villains that, well, they are up there, but definitely... In a more prominent light, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <coughs> a fantastic addition to have these two characters. Purely because, I mean, Penguin in the books by this point was never really explored as, like, the psychopath, the yeah. the mobster who gets shit done. You know, he was very much, like... Penguin, to me, was very much a villain who was laughed at quite a lot, you know, he wasn't a villain that was ever really taken seriously, but this film really kind of put some of It took it in a dark turn though, like a very very fucking dark place, like, okay, it's a Tim Burton movie, of course it's going to have dark themes throughout it, but realistically, wow, 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 And, Both. you know, Danny DeVito plays the Penguin, and we have Michelle Pfeiffer as... Here, here's the thing, see, Danny DeVito... I can't imagine anyone else playing him, like playing a penguin. Like, yeah, my you you've seen the comics. We, uh, dumpy fat man, you know, like he he was absolutely perfect for this role, and he played it in such a kind of chaotic, kind of maniac way that it worked. Yeah, and I think Michelle Pfeiffer plays a fantastic Catwoman. Oh, hands down, hands down. She had a a lot of good stuff, but we'll get to them a little bit further on. Mario, would you like to explain the story to our lovely listeners? Just yes. A, a basic. Yes, a basic yes, yes. Down. The story, well, as I was getting at, the cobble pots are a bunch of dicks, aren't they? Oh, they always have been. Like, oh, hold on, our son looks a bit different. Let's chuck him in the fucking river and, like, bid our farewells to him. He's gone for our lives. We do not have a son. Our family name will die with us. Fucking cunts. Yeah, that's a, that's a very sad intro. Um, uh, uh, sad? It's fucking morbid. Doesn't You're it killing a child? Like, literally, Penguin could do anything, and I would totally take his side on it because of that. I'm like, oh, no wonder you like that, son. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'd, I feel for you, mate. Kill whoever you want, you know what I mean? I know, like, we'll get into it eventually, but his return to the spotlight? Wow. Uh, so we were in, were introduced to the Cobblepots in such a cunty way, and then uh, from one cunt to another, James. Well, two cunts to another cunt. Max Shrek, misogynist and uh, a woman abuser. <laughs> Full time misogynist, part time woman abuser. <laughs> like. As soon as Selena Kyle's like, oh, what, what about this? Like, ah, uh, she's no, she, she's forgot a tongue. She doesn't know her place. Pick, and then I love the little play on cat got your tongue. Yes, you know uh, this. This film is. I would normally say with other films it rips the piss with its puns, but do you know something? I'm not even gonna say it. I think yeah, the puns there, just there were to there were too 
I, as you know from our titles, we like to have a kind of a dirty sense of mind with our episode titles. You know, looking well, personally, looking through some of the dialogue going, hold on, we've got a pun right there for the title. James, I have lost track of how many fucking puns I picked up in this movie. Well, this is a true challenge. This will like this will skyrocket us into like stability. But we'll get to the name at yes, the end. Yes. You know what I mean. So anyway, Cobblepot's been flung in a. In the yeah, river. no, no, no. Max Shrek uh, being an absolute cunt. I, I, I overuse that term right now, but I can't use any other word to describe him. He's a bastard. As soon as he's down to do the little speech for the light, which didn't you feel was a little bit maybe. You know, the, the, the turning on the lights for the tree at Gotham. Don't you think there wasn't that many people there for the tree of Gotham, you know, for Christmas, you know? Yeah, I don't but think there was. I think, I think I've got an explanation for that because he came in right out the building and walked right to it. So I'm saying that this is like the business district. So Gotham's got its higher ups and there's not many of them. And that's why. Mm-hmm. Like the, the rest of the filth aren't going to go anywhere near that. Mm-hmm. That's that's my interpretation of it. Well, I mean, absolutely. You know, Gotham and every book, every game, and every f- everything that it's, you know, shown in is shown as a very scummy place. It's shown as a place where, you know, there are rich elitists, yes. but there are m- many more poorer people, sort of middle class, lower class people who are scraping to get by, if you will. And, you know, these elites sort of run the show in Gotham. And, you know, uh, in comics and stuff, you find Bruce Wayne kind of going up against these elites, even though he's seen as one by Gothamites and yeah. such. Um, So, yeah, I think that's very much a case. It's sort of like, oh, this is a little switch on for the elites, you know, keep keep the rats at bay, keep them yeah. away, do you know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of, I, I would get that too, you know, yeah, that's the kind of. Yeah. That's how I would receive that, you know, message that, you know, there aren't many people who are rich and well off in Gotham. And why would you want to be rich and well off in Gotham? It just instantly makes you yeah, target A material. target for someone to, you know, kill you. <laughs> <laughs> cough, <laughs> cough, Bruce Wayne's parents. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, the the, the uh, Red uh, the Circus Gang? Yeah. Yeah, don't you think that that actually, that entire scene was... M- played out in such a big scale like there was a lot going on and and initially i thought it was just that little square where the tree was but it's like another kind of block through a tunnel and stuff that it's like very it's it's made to feel more than just one block it feels like that entire maybe business district of gotham that's involved in this well Part of that's really down to the fact that, you know, the business district do deem themselves above. You know, it's like uh, Canary Wharf in London. Not that everyone who works at Canary Wharf thinks that they're above everyone else, but that's a good analogy. You know, it's big, yeah, it's yeah, business, yeah. It's, scrape, it's skyscrapers. It's, it's an amazing place, you know. And that's what the business district of Gotham is. Very, you know, highly built, you know, pristinely kept, you know. It's, it's that kind of thing. So, you know, the richer characters in Gotham do try to make a point of showing that they're rich. And yeah. Like, they're, they are like a, a sort of little town, effectively, of their own. And the rest of Gotham is sort of cut off from that. So, that's the kind of message I think that's trying to show. This film does try to show you the more uh, elitist, rich, money-making people who, <laughs> funnily enough, are criminals. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the, that's the thing. Um the criminals who tend to cause the bother are the people who are the most well off. So, yeah, I definitely think that was what that was setting up for. It was kind of setting up to show how much, you know, the wealthy in Gotham have over the poor, uh, which they put into, you know, their enjoyment and the things that they've got. But, m- you know, moving on from that, you know, we're, we're kind of introduced to Bruce Wayne again. Yeah. Uh, well, well... Uh, Bruce Wayne's introduced to Selina Kyle, first of all. Yeah. Uh, through the whole fight scene with him being dressed as Batman and giving her the bat stare. Did you notice that? He, he kind of stared at her too long and His not really seen anything. His bat stare. <laughs> like, he's just looking at her, just like, 
with his like just Morticia Adams eyes, just like the only thing that's white on him, and then he just like fucks off. And Selena's like, oh, "Who's this guy? Like the the, ba- the Batman? Like looking at me? Oh, th- like this has made her night clearly." And then uh, he fucks off, and then that leaves Selena all open to uh, getting shoved out a window because reasons. Because Max Shrek, again, I apologise, is a cunt. Yes, yes he is. Um, he is not a nice man. He pushes sweet, sweet Selena Kyle out of a window. And let me tell you right now, Selena Kyle is very much protected by me because this film that was made in... 92. 90s, 92. 92. Two years before my birth. Got Catwoman more right than the Catwoman movie. So, you know, take pointers, like... Selena Kyle in this, at the start, is very... She's got a comical side. She's still the innocent sort of... Yeah, using using the taser on the guy that just, like, held her up, like, in yeah, front of she, Batman. Yeah, she has a, a tiny dark side, do you know what I mean? Like, But it's self-preservation, and that's what I like about it, because she is kind of sweet and innocent, but she would protect herself if she needed to, and that, to me, is very Selena Kyle. And... You know, we said about it in the Catwoman review, obviously, that Michelle Pfeiffer did have that sort of dark streak. She wasn't, like, completely innocent. Like, she yeah. was capable, yeah, yeah. and that was shown. And when she gets put out the window, she dies. Well, now, I, w- I would say she falls through multiple kind of, like, canopies, like, for the building, and then she hits the ground. So I'm saying right there, she's obviously taking a series hit to go through each one, but slowing her down. And then she hits a concrete, so I'm saying that she's got brain damage right there. Like, right from the get-go, that's this this sets on her entire well, I mean, uh, this is the thing. changing persona instead of a fucking halitosis fucking cat. Well, there is still a cat that crawls on her, which, yeah, which yeah. by the way, isn't CGI. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it really doesn't have halitosis. And is um. That's how you put effort into your movie. But, um, yeah, so when she comes back, she comes back with a... You know, it's it, it's like something in her has just snapped. Yeah, that's why I'm know, saying she's got a bit of brain damage her because she's not completely herself. We, we only get a small snippet of how she is. But we know that how, what she turns into isn't obviously who she yeah. was, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, she kind of... She's in a bit of a plot for vengeance. Yeah. Um, so she's not. If she, I mean, if she is brain damaged, she's not that brain damaged. Yeah, she's yeah. forgotten it. But I think, I think very much before this, she's very much just been the working woman. I think the idea of Catwoman in this is to be someone who is perfectly sane and normal, and who goes through one bad day. Yeah, one extremely bad day. One extremely bad day that sets her over the edge, and it kind of it kind of reminds me. Of the Joker a little bit. Yeah. It's like, you know, that near death experience that changed her. Mm. Which is um which is quite interesting. Uh so yeah, you know, we, we we're introduced to Catwoman that way. And also right before that we are shown the true extent of what an absolute prick Max Shrek is. <laughs> the penguin just <laughs> going, Oh, what about your toxin uh, toxic waste? Oh, that could be from anywhere. Oh, what about the paperwork for it? Oh, that would have been shredded, taped up. And then he's like, "What about uh, some other guy?" And he's like, uh, "He's on vacation." And he's like, "Hey, it's me. It's whoever's hand." And you're just like, "Well, this guy is blackmailing him to fuck Penguin." This is what I love about Penguin. He is an absolute wee shit in this, <laughs> but he's he's almost doing Batman's job better than him because he knows all this is going on. Yeah, that's like he's he's got the evidence of like someday dying, you know, like that would be Batman in a second. But as we discussed last time, uh, for Tim Burton's Batman, he's a shit Batman. Yes, yes, he is. And um, like I said, like on the subject of Penguin, there, Penguin has always been renowned for being a little shit, right? Even when he's not mad, you know, he's renowned for being a little shit. But it's because he's intelligent, and the Penguin really has nothing to lose. In yeah. terms of like, especially in this film, you know, I mean, he doesn't have a family, he doesn't have 
you know, the comforts and stuff like that. He doesn't even have his gang. Yeah. You know, so he Billy, has Billy does have a, a the sur- the Red Triangle gang or the Circus gang. Yeah, whatever he's got a small gang, but it's not like his big crime syndicate yeah. that, you know, we're used to seeing him with. So it's quite interesting to see that, but he is absolutely thrived, man. There is Aye. like this is the good thing about these Tim Burton films. The uh, Tim Burton goes to the extent to make sure the villains' heads are fried. Like there is something not right with them, and that's good. You know, yep. it, it it pushes it. Like I love, for example, Michelle Pfeiffer in this, and I love Danny DeVito in this. The the they are Catwoman's probably the most comic accurate to a yeah. degree, but Penguin is something completely new and fresh. And it just works. You know, I think, you know, in Batman Forever, when they were doing Two-Face and Riddler, they thought, oh, Penguin was a success. So let's fry these <laughs> these guys' brains. Literally, yeah. let's fry their brains. Let's, like, burn Two-Face and let's um, just literally fry the Riddler's brain and boom, we're sorted. But the thing is with Penguin was that Penguin had a lot of charm in this film. Penguin is sitting there like, do what you want to me because I'll get the last laugh in the end. And that's the kind of thing that he goes by, and I like that. I really like that with him. He's um, he's so unpredictable as a villain. Yeah, and that's that's what makes him really interesting. And honestly, I'm so surprised that no film today in the mo- in our modern age has tried to bring Penguin into it. They would obviously try to make him more realistic because he's not someone who has, you know, he's not ins- he's not actually insane. The penguin, really? Yeah. I mean, he gets put in the Arkham, but he's not really insane. He's just a bad man who a does bad things. A violent prick. Yeah, he's a bad man who does bad things, and that's how that should be looked at. So this film obviously takes it and gives him a more childish approach, but it's so dark and adult at the same time that's just... It's like when he was thrown into the river as a child, he stayed a child. Yeah. That's what it feels like to me, because he's all like, oh, yeah, like... You know, I, we, I I can do this. Everything's fine, you know, and he's not scared. And that's that's a good villain. If you ask me, that's a good villain. Yeah. A villain who is so smart, so intelligent, so charismatic, and so unable to give a fuck about what's going to happen. And I love that. Yeah. But yes, anyway, so further on through the story, we see... Uh, well, one thing I picked up, Batman... Well, Batman. Bruce Wayne nearly makes a cock-up. Again. Yes, well, Again. well, <laughs> not 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 the good way, but the bad way, and uh, nearly fucks up by saying, "Oh, I've I've met you before to Selena Kyle," and she's like, "Have I?" And he's like, "Oh, oh, you know what? You, like you 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 look you look familiar. Like, have I seen you before? No, oh, oh, I must have been mistaken." So he nearly makes a cock up, but that's the thing. It maybe it was mesmerized before by her the night previous. And then he's seen her again, and he's like, whoa, 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 sh- sh- wow, she works here. like, And he's just caught in that moment mm-hmm. where it's hard to differentiate between the two personas, Bruce Wayne and Batman. Which is kind of something I want to get into later on, but uh, we'll, we'll keep on it's with the story. Of, see the thing with Bruce Wayne, right? Because see the carnival stuff during the day? Like yes. The first meeting, that's at night, isn't it? But yeah, um, that's... Um, you know, it's like you say, it's differentiating between the two personas. When he's Batman, he's very cold, very silent, very jaded, and very n- uncooperative with people. Whereas during the day, he's Bruce Wayne. Yeah, that's what he's had to get into his head. During the day, I'm Bruce Wayne. At night, I'm Batman. And it's like you say, you know, that difficulty to really grasp his situation that that is his life. And when he sees Selina as Bruce Wayne, he's like. He's thinking as a human, he's thinking as Bruce Wayne. Whereas at night, he's thinking, she's just a civilian. Leave yeah. her. Do you know what I mean? And it's very different to how like you know other actors have portrayed Batman in that sense. Because I think one thing that certainly gets missed is the dual life and how it plays on his mind mentally. And how he genuinely believes that him, Bruce Wayne and Batman are two completely different personas. Um, which is explored in comics like Batman R.I.P. Yep. You know, things like that. Where it's like, what if Batman was just Batman and Bruce Wayne wasn't present, you know? Mm. What if Bruce Wayne didn't exist in his head effectively and he was completely Batman? He would be violent, he would be evil, he would be sinister and he would kill people. Bruce Wayne is the humanity that brings that back. So it's like I say, it's 
it's understanding how severe his situation actually is mentally because Batman and Bruce Wayne are two completely different characters and that's a really interesting point to make because a thing that always gets missed out is that Batman is just as mad as the villains, you know what I mean? Like That's a big point oh, to me. Oh, of course. Um, but he's doing it because he thinks he's right and to some degree, you know, he's the hero. We agree with him, we think he's right. But is he right? Like, what if he goes that step too far? Yeah. That's always the question with him. And in the past, he has. So, you know, that's that. But, yeah. But, like the first film, there was a good bit of fluff in this. Mm-hmm. But some actual good fluff, mate. Good did fluff. You, yeah. Did you notice that it w- she was mentioned once, but kind of, it was a couple of times it was dropped that Bruce Wayne was actually still reeling from a past relationship. With Vicky Vale. Oh, oh Vicky Vale. Oh, can we just forget about her? She's not. No, no, oh. I, I like that. There's that connection between the pre- this movie and the previous film. There's a instant connection to go like, oh, why isn't she here? And maybe b- I think it's hinted that she couldn't handle everything that was going on. Yeah. So, well, obviously, a killer clown tries to like seduce you and you. I'm sure you wouldn't be okay coming out the other end of that, would you? No, no, I suppose you wouldn't. But to be fair, to be fair, yeah, she, 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 you know, she's a bit of a Vicky Vale, right? To me, has always been a character that goes out of her way to get what she wants, you know. And in the first film, you know, she's not effectively like that, but you know, she's with the Joker, like, there was bits where I was seeing, like, bits of Harley Quinn in her. Yeah. I was just seeing that, oh, I could be tempted with the Joker. He seems nice. He can fit a two, f- he can fit a two foot long gun in his trousers. I wonder what else he's got in there. <laughs> like, a fucking cobra. <laughs> like, it's, um, that's it. But I, I, I just, I like Vicky Vale when she's Vicky Vale. Yeah. When she's the reporter. The first film made her a complete love interest and that wasn't a Vicky Vale. Vicky Vale to me is a reporter who actually, while she supports Batman, she goes against him. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I just felt Vicky, they were like, Vicky Vale's a popular name, let's use that. You know, people who like the comics will know Vicky Vale, but, you know, it, it wasn't Vicky Vale, it was just a name, really, in that film. It connects it, makes it, ah, feel, it, makes it, makes feel, it feel bigger, you know, like. Ah, it makes it feel like this Batman Returns genuinely has a past. Yeah. And also, it makes it feel like Batman, well, Bruce Wayne is, I don't know, maybe even more emotionally scarred from it. Having found someone that he likes, because as we established, Batman, Tim Burton's Batman was kind of year one Batman. Yeah. So he's found someone that he's shared all this with, she knows everything, and maybe he just was too open with her. And she couldn't handle it. So maybe he's also emotionally scarred from this, which is also a kind of good parallel for Selena Kyle. She's very kind of mousy and stuff to start. Kind of. Oh, I like, like what you done there. Like I like what you done there, mousy. Oh, that was an unintentional mice. pun. Mate, mice. I'm that. here for the puns, whether I mean um, them or not. I'm in it. I'm in it. Right, okay. But uh, yeah, so she's a little bit mousy. She's uh, a little bit scarred, you know, like from she makes jokes about guys and stuff when she's feeding her cat you know uh, crazy cat lady <laughs> to ah. be fair this one of the best lines you know and like you know you know my boyfriend swells by it is the bit when she walks in she's like honey I'm home oh wait I forgot I'm not married <laughs> like yeah. it's it's that humour like that sort of my life is such a mess and I know it but like I can still make fun of myself I can still she, yeah she's got that humour even when she becomes Catwoman, she's still taking the piss out of you. Saying, it's great, you know. She's just like, I don't care. I'm here for the banter, and that's um, that's a big deal to me. You know, that's that's what Catwoman is to me. She's a character who takes the piss out of everyone else and effectively herself. You know, yeah. she is a she's a strong character, and her strength is shown by through her ability to make jokes at anything. You know, she could be facing death death itself and she's just like ah it's alright I've got it covered <laughs> we're alright we're cool make sex joke 
Yeah, yeah there's on. there's many sex jokes in this, but we <laughs> won't get into them all. Just the pussy I've been waiting for. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Never been more straight watching a film than <laughs> anything in my life. I love it so much. It's great. Some of the stuff Penguin hits it with is absolute genius. And whoever wrote it deserves to be awarded. Like, it, it, But again, that interaction between Batman's villains. Yeah. <laughs> like it's saying that kind of stuff to each other. Like, You could imagine that being the Daily Convo. You know, like, oh, who am I talking to the new? Oh, fuck, it's fucking Catwoman, all right? I'm going to make a cat joke. Uh, how's your pussy? Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing you expect, you know? It's <laughs> it's derogatory, but they're yeah. bad people. So that's the kind of What, pattern. so they get away with it? No, they don't get away with it. But who's going to honestly go, uh, like, someday, like, a psychopath? A genuine psychopath? I know, like, hold on, you shouldn't really say that. Women's rights... Stab. <laughs> Why did you do it, Mario? <laughs> Why did you do it? Stab. 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 Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, the thing is, is a lot of people in a lot of films, especially more and more, more recently, people don't like the... People don't like the fact that villains say things that are a bit over the edge. Th- like, characters will say things that are a bit over the edge, and especially if they're villains, people are like, oh... Oh, I didn't you like that joke about uh, or that line about this topic or that topic? Well, and that's it's just the like thing. the villains, villains aren't people. supposed to be liked. Well, this is the thing, you know. It's it, it's that kind of way where people need to understand that movies and reading and stuff like that works of fiction are written to display a certain thing, you know. So, you know, Penguin saying a certain thing like a derogatory term, you know, about Catwoman, you know, just the pussy I've been waiting for. It's a total bloke joke, but everybody's sort of laughing at it purely because she's a cat. Yeah. And it's just, it's it's a play on words and everything, and it's great. But people like to look at those kind of things like, oh, that was a bit derogatory for me. I didn't didn't like that. I wouldn't show my child this movie. It's like, well, good. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, villains have to act a certain way and see if a villain can be funny. Yeah. And not just funny, consistently funny. That is just. That's good writing. That that is good villainage right there. You know, make the villain somebody funny. Make the audience laugh at them. Like we said with the Joker in the first film, he makes you laugh purely because he's just like, oh, I've not done anything wrong. You you've killed like fifty people. Oh, I've not done anything wrong. You know, that is how you make a good villain to me. And you know, these two films have had great villains. Yeah. You know? And Catwoman in this is portrayed more as a villain as well, which I quite like until, well, until well, the sort of yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until the end, but she is portrayed as a villain, which is good. They well, didn't just go into the whole. Well, not really. There's a scene where a guy's mugging a woman, and she beats a guy up. So there's that. So she is kind of the great, the I whole th- great I, I area throughout. There, there is that grey area, but I think that was because of a man pushed her out a window. So she has this vendetta. I mean, Catwoman hasn't really had a vendetta against men, but she has a vendetta against bad men. You yeah. know, like, and like I say, it's that idea of her standing up for another woman. And it, and it's wonderful how it's done because she literally just goes down, throws herself at the guy, and like, the guy doesn't know what to do. It's it's great. Like, yeah. and there is that grey area, but I think it's this film really portrayed her as she was really only out for herself. She wanted something and she was going for it. And, you know, when she's seen somebody needing help along the way, she was there. You know, it's very much, she's very anti hero. Yeah, you know, and that's what makes her good because she does have a heart underneath it all, which is you know can be explained by the fact pushed out a window, you know, almost died, you know, things just aren't going well in her life, you know. So she has this power now and this confidence to do what she's doing, and that just works for me. Like I say, the dynamic between Catwoman and Penguin is fantastic, as well as Batman being in it. You know, like it feels more like it genuinely feels like a film that's more about the villains. Because they are genuinely hurt, and there's a reason why they're doing what they're doing. And um, yeah, you don't really get that with the Joker. You always hated the Joker in the first film, whereas in this one, you actually feel sorry for them. Catwoman was flung out a window. Penguin was like thrown in a river as a child. It's um, it, it's good that way because you're sort of like, do you know what, Batman? Just let them do what they're doing. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And it also shows that, and it also shows that just about anybody. Given a bad day or a, a whole bad lifetime, 
can push you in a different direction. You know, anything could happen. You know, it's like it's like the Joker's classic line for the Kevin joke. You know, all it takes is one bad day to push the sanest of men to madness, and it's it's so true. And that's it's a recurring theme with all of Batman's villains. Usually, a lot of them aren't villains for the sake of being villains. They're villains because something traumatic genuinely happened. Mostly at the hands of Batman, <laughs> but yeah. something happened to them, and they it, it feels like them being that way is them re- getting control of their life, you know, and doing what they want to do. And while we don't agree with them, can you blame them? No, not really. No, it's that it's something that anyone can relate to. To be honest, I mean that's the thing I've always felt. I've always felt that Batman's villains are a good representation of mental health. Yeah, you know, Two Face, like. Multiple scarred personality disorder, you and know, like if if you go back to stuff like the uh, Dark Knight, mm-hmm. isn't there a bit of a play on Two Face? Then you know, like he's a good guy, but then oh, he's coming down hard on cops and stuff. And then I'm pretty sure in the animated series as well, there's also a little play on that. Like he's got a kind of a it's very much may, almost may, may, maybe he's a little bit bipolar, you know, like something. Yeah, you've got that sort of you you know. I mean, Two Face is a character like genuinely built on anger problems, and even before he was Two Face, he had anger problems because of the stress of trying to clear Gotham out, and he couldn't do it because he had to follow the rules. When he's Two Face, he doesn't have to follow the rules, and a lot of the time, you know, he's made to be somebody who robs banks and stuff like that. But you That's know, that's not him. But the idea of him is, like, in his heart, he genuinely believes that what he, he could be doing is right. But he flips his coin not to make the decision because he believes that fate made him that way. So fate should decide what he does next. That's the kind of thing that, you know, gets you. And that's you know very interesting. You know, Catwoman is a character who, as well, pushes to, like, you know, needing something. I mean, she's... She's anything but bipolar, but you could push her into that kind of yeah, category yeah. of like, oh, if she's like, oh, I really need to, I really need some new jewelry. I'm going to go out and take some jewelry. You know what I mean? You know that spontaneous nature. And all of Batman's villains do have sort of connotations to mental health. Catwoman, more of a kind of good guy esque. She's very much somebody who does her own thing. Um, and not all of the villains are like that. But this film sort of portrays Penguin as being someone who was abandoned as a child. You know, he was angry and you know, raised by penguins and mm. um, less said the better um yeah <laughs> raised by penguins no we're going to talk about that we are going to talk about that no and well then, i can and you <laughs> and you've got you know you've got joker who fuck knows what he has but you know he's 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 well and truly you oh, know gone. most his shit <laughs> like but yeah that's uh, an interesting little tidbit there on batman's villains you know you can always look into them yes um, always some fantastic do that. stuff but um yeah, so later on in this film... Well, before uh, we get into anything else, there's a lot of nice little scenes of Bruce Wayne... uh going to sound old fucking fashioned here. Courting Selena Kyle, like, going on, like, bringing her around the mansion for a wee date and stuff, and then, oh, oh, hold on, uh, Alfred, just just, uh, just say something like, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm going out of town or something. And then she's like, oh, sh- sh- I've got to be somewhere... Oh, uh, just say I've got a thing. Uh, come up with a dirty lim- limerick or something. And he's like, one has sprung to mind. I will do my old pathetic man again. I won't fucking care, James. And uh, there's there's those those nice little build ups. It's definitely a better love story in this movie than there was in Batman. Because they both live the same life, but yeah. on opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, they're they're mirror versions of each other. They're made for each other. Yes, that which, has always been something. Which is something really nice. It's nice to see, but there's just in the run up to the third act and the penguin just not giving a fuck, wanting to blow up Gotham because he feels rejected, which <laughs> he's not really helped himself with. Some uh, some proper fucking supervillain plots in this film, <laughs> like yeah. uh, controlling the Batmobile and a little kiddie cart thing to like try and mow down civilians come on like all the weaponry in the car we're, we're not shown the greatest extent of weaponry in the car but i'd imagine it'd be quite a lot compared to the bat wing and the bat jet and uh the bat ski in this the bat so <laughs> the bat the, 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 the <laughs> like there, there's a lot of weaponry on these machines so for him just to use the, 
Batmobile to try and mow folk down. I felt that was maybe just playing it too nice, you know? And then he's like, ah, old lady, 12 o'clock. But then Batman gains control of it again and stuff. So that's the descent of the Penguin from kind of almost mere uh, cobblepot to just the Penguin again. Did we mention that he was raised by penguins? Yes, we did, and we're not talking about that. Yes, James. we are talking about that. I the can't bring myself. The penguin is so mad because he was raised by penguins, and if that is not reason enough to know that penguins are malicious little fucks, then you know, go 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 get yourself raised by a penguin for a couple of days. It's absolute genius. Can we talk about the penguin? The penguin bombs. Yes, we will in time. <laughs> we will in time. Uh, and after that, you've got the whole Selena Kyle, Bruce Wayne kind of like. You you see that they've got their struggles and stuff. Like Batman's fought Catwoman a couple of times and stuff, and uh, like they're walking through the streets of Gotham together. And uh, uh, there's also more fat shaming, James. There is a hell of a lot more. Da 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 fat shaming da 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 worth maz. So Mario, please tell us um what your problem with Batman is now. No, 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 it's not actually Batman this time. It's the script. Like the script has it in for the women in these two movies. Like your lead female is fat shamed in Batman by Batman himself, and this time. They're walking through the streets and she's like, I can't believe what they're saying about Catwoman. Like, one news report said that she was £140. And then Bruce Wayne, fucking Bruce Wayne, he's a <laughs> fucking dickhead. <laughs> I, I said it last time, he's a shit Batman. This time, he's a shit fucking human being. See see if a woman goes, oh, like, oh, I feel fat or whatever. Your <laughs> automatic response should be, no, you're lovely, but... <laughs> not just out of like reason to be like, oh no, you're not like you so uh <laughs> <laughs> no, but like Bruce Wayne doesn't even acknowledge it. He's he's just already walked past this newspaper, and it's like uh, Batman blows it. So that's that's what he says. He just goes, yeah, like Batman blows it. Like he saved millions of dollars of uh, property. Like Bruce. The woman is just fucking said something about a woman being... Mi- I wouldn't even say overweight. Like, 140 pounds isn't overweight. It's just the society going, oh, women must be size fucking whatever. And it's... a uh, fuck. Like, see, honestly, whoever fucking wrote these two scripts needs to have their fucking boss fucking heavily booted. Maybe it was Milo but Manara when he planned on, you know, doing a wee jaunt about. Oh, don't even start about fucking but, uh, Yeah, um... Like, you know, like what, what? Like, am I, am I the only one that's picking this up that someone has it in for women in their way? The, like first, going fi- the first film was absolute fat shaming and I was I was there for it, right? Aye. But the, the second film was just completely like, no, I'm not just like, I really don't give like, a fuck about ba- how fat ba- you ba- are, like. Bruce Wayne is just like, doesn't even acknowledge it with a facial expression. He's just like, hold on. That uh, newspaper I walked by, Batman blows it. Like, no, he didn't. Like, which is a nice little parallel. They've got their problems with the media. Like, the media's putting a spin on both of their alter egos, dragging them through the dark. And it's just, it's, it's, it's nice that they not only are connecting us to singles and whatever in a crazy world of Gotham, but they're also connecting with like little bits like this and. It's very nice to see, like, that from them instead of just, oh, we're doing this. It was very much to showcase and highlight the fact that these two characters are actually the same people. Yeah. You know, they are they are made for each other, and Catwoman and Batman have always been made for each other. There's never any denial of that. So you know that f- that bit of the film really kind of done that because it's and like you also say, it's like she's saying she's worrying about like you know, you, you know, are not, to be, not like to be not to be stereotypical, but it's. it's it's a womanly thing, you know, to, yeah, yeah. to, to you know, really concern about your weight. And, you know, ladies, you shouldn't. But, like... like I'm uh, surprised that we never got a scene where Catwoman finds a news reporter that reported this and, like, cuts his balls off with her claws. Because that would have been too far. Right? No, I <laughs> think that would have been justice. Just, like, but, £140. Pounds. Look at Does this look like £140? Pounds? But, I mean, look at the difference between it. Because she's sitting there going, fucking... News reports saying I'm 140 pounds. Am I fuck? Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, and then you've got Batman going, 
I didn't destroy all that stuff. Did I fuck? I saved it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, there is that two ends of the spectrum and it's like, to him it's all about like, <laughs> to, to, to Batman it's like, to Bruce Wayne it's like, didn't he do that? I didn't, I didn't blow all that money. I didn't do that. And then Catwoman's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's the lady like thing to go, how dare that fucking bitch say that I'm 140 like, pounds like that what a fucking lie i'll get on the fucking scales right now and prove her wrong how fucking dare she i'm gonna go up to her fucking office and kill her or him whatever if it's a him he's certainly getting killed if it's a woman we'll talk it out but you know that's the that's the thing you know it shows you the two different sides yeah. of them and the, what kind of and like i say right weight is obviously a bigger shoot a lot of people yeah but see cat women it's not a problem right she she doesn't really care do you know what i mean like but, you know, you've got that sort of thing where, where she's just... It's, it's almost like a subtle joke. It's almost like... Like... They're reporting that I'm 140 pounds. How do they know that? Like, you know what I mean? It's it's that kind of... She's still trying to... Th- she's thinking about, like, how the fuck? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's how she thinks, and that's good. Whereas Batman's sort of thinking of the mere logistical side of it. I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. Like, yeah, and that takes us to their... Their... F- kind of like final scenes together they go to the ball together and that is actually a really nice scene it's clearly done intentionally with Catwoman and well Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne both going to a masked ball unmasked and Catwoman makes a nice little line of oh I'm tired of masks like she she's not been doing this as long as Batman clearly but it's shown the mental and physical drain on her. Like, she looks fucking, like, n- exhausted. And she's, uh, to the point of emotionally scarred that she shows Bruce Wayne her gun. Like, she's got a gun to kill Max Shrek. Like, the guy that pushed her out a window and tried to fucking kill her. So, she's just done with the world. She's just like, I don't care, I'm going to kill him. And they can do whatever they want with me. But Bruce Wayne brings it all back. Obviously, he, he kind of suspects something. And they throw in the mistletoe ki- uh, kiss line, which... He, I'm I'm guessing at this point he knows that she's Catwoman. Yeah. But obviously she doesn't know that he's Batman. And you see the... Well, I mean, like Mor- you, s- great you see the prop- and all that. Yeah. You, know I mean? like you see the proper emotional torment going through her face at this point. Just like, what, what? Like she even says to him, like, does this mean that we need to start fighting? And clearly, she sees a hard vendetta against Batman for like pushing her off a roof and whatever and stuff. He didn't mean that. He was. If he wanted to, he could have, like, stopped her another way or he could have done worse. And now that she sees that the man behind the mask, she's who she's grown attached to, she's like, he's not a bad guy. So that makes Batman not a bad guy. And then just as they're about to go away and uh, talk their differences out and stuff and maybe happily live, af- live happily ever after and whatever, uh, Penguin strikes... And that's where the penguin bombs come in, James. Penguin bombs. Penguin bombs are the best weapon ever created by a penguin ever. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's... <laughs> it's... Uh, in a lot of your Lego Batman games, penguin will always be seen as having a penguin that will blow someone up or do something mental. You know, do you remember the days when the penguin was all about his umbrellas? Yes. Yeah, well, no, in this film. <laughs> like, you know. Oh, but he has the, the hypnosis umbrella. <laughs> and oh, no, no, no. That's just to uh, give him a splitting headache. But uh, uh, that that line was very nice. Like, uh, Max Shrek going, is that supposed to hypnotise me? No, it's supposed to give you a splitting headache. And then he just aims the uh, umbrella just ever so slightly away. Bang, fires. That's beautiful right there. That's Penguin. You know, that's Penguin all over. You know what I mean? He's just penguin. <laughs> but I, um, that's what it is. You know, penguin bombs are great. What did you think of the penguin bombs? Did you like them? I Peter like them. would be on top of this, like, <laughs> going to town on Batman. Batman as well, which I'll get into. But also Penguin, if he had survived, would have been suffering severe consequences for using penguins as a 
weapons of mass destruction. Because uh, Batman uses bats to distract Penguin and push him through the glass. Now that's fucking cruelty to animals right there. Do you know something? I don't even care by that point. <laughs> by that point, I just don't give a fuck. Penguins are everywhere. Fucking bats are everywhere. Do you know what? I'm at it. Right, I just, you know, literally all cat women had to do was bring an entourage of cats, and then yeah. I would have just been like, this is too far fetched for me. <laughs> but, um, aye, that's, wh- that's where your film sort of ends. Well, it ends after, with after cat women and Max Shrek uh, appearing to die, Bruce Wayne revealing himself to Max Shrek, which was actually a quite a nice line before he dies. He's like, Bruce Wayne? Why are you dressed like Batman? And Catwoman's just like, it is because he's Batman, like, why else would anyone be dressed as Batman? You know, it's, I uh, it's uh, it's still that that gullible nature because I mean yeah, like oh, hold on, like you you're you're Batman, you are such a like pathetic piece of shit. <laughs> it's it's nice. I mean, it doesn't. The film has a sort of bittersweet ending, I would say. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of like Catwoman finally getting her revenge, but also disappearing. That's that's quite a sad moment, because Bruce, you could tell that Bruce was maybe like fed up with this already, and he, from the looks of things, he did love and care for her. Yeah, and I mean that's always the very twisted side of their story because Catwoman usually always leaves. Yeah. Purely because she can't do it anymore, she doesn't want to be in Gotham anymore. I mean. Like Catwoman's sort of whole story has always been that she, you know, she she does she she does reside in Gotham and she does help Batman and she does do X Y Z and she has a relationship intimately with him in the comics, but sometimes she just doesn't want that anymore. She wants to start again and have a new life, and that does have an emotional burden on, you know, Bruce because yeah. you know they are quintessentially they're made for each other. They are absolutely made for each other, and you know they there is that grey area with Catwoman, but whenever Batman's with Catwoman, there's a grey area. Yeah, you know sometimes he'll let her away with things and stuff like that. A lot of the time he won't, but sometimes he will, and that's the really nice thing about that that he cares enough about her to handle her differently. You know and. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest here. I think Michelle Pfeiffer played one of the best Catwomans I've seen. Definitely better than Halle Berry. It was, it was different. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, right? I liked Anne Hathaway doing it. Mm-hmm. But there wasn't that comedic charm to her. I didn't think. Mm. There was a few in-jokes, but... Yeah, just when she vanishes on Batman and that, that was really it. Aye, but even then, it's like, there was none of that sort of flirty banter, there was nothing like that, I mean... Yeah, there actually really wasn't, it was very flat. I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't exactly have flirty banter with Christian Bale, just saying. But, you know, that's what felt like it was missing. It, because Nolan grounded his films, he maybe would have felt that that was too cartoony, or that wasn't right. Yeah. But it worked in this, because Catwoman was a bit mad. And everything was just a, ch- a sex joke to her. Everything yeah. was a joke. Everything was this and that. Uh, even the line that is going to be our episode title, James, is one of Catwoman's many epic lines. Take it away. Today's episode title is brought to you by Catwoman, who once said, always confusing your pistols with your privates. I've done that a few times. I usually refer to my privates as pistols. All right, fire and blanks again. Oh fuck off! Ah, pun king. Let's talk about costumes before we. Yes, yes, up. costumes. Uh, Batman's costume, pretty much the uh, same. Yeah, really. pretty, pretty much. much. Not nothing really different. Catwoman's, wow, homemade realness. Yes. <laughs> Selena, the challenge this week is homemade leather realness. Hit us with something, and she hit out with that. Like that was fucking. That's a good costume. Like, I'm not going to lie, that, like, watching that as a kid, not knowing what sex he was, but always just going, I like her. I like the kind of design on it, the stitch. It's almost, I never even noticed it back then, but it's almost like a kind of corset as well, like, in the mid-region almost. It's, it's, like it's, the, it's like the stitching 
yeah, sort yeah. of like because the whole outfit is sort of it looks like it's been shoddily put together. Yeah, but in the best way, and that outfit kind of reflects on her. Like she's a broken woman. Want to know as well the moment that she comes in the house and she's like grabbing things and then she sees this and uh, she's gonna like make a costume and she's like smashing shit. See the lights that says hello there. She, uh, I only noticed it this time round, but she smashes out the T for there, and the O and hello, so hell here. Mm. I fucking love that. I I never even noticed it until I actually had to rewind it to make sure. Like, hold on, I remember that sign there before, but she smashed out the T, and I'm like, hell here, fucking. It's little things like that that really get me off. Aye, it's this sort of idea that she has a broken woman, she's a destroyed woman, and that kind of came across in the costume, you know, it was very stitched together, it was very makeshift, yeah. but it was a good sort of analogy for her life, Yeah. you know, it was it was, it was, was broken apart and she has to put it, she has to put it right, she has to make it practical, she has to put it together, and I, and I, th- and I still think to this day, one, Michelle Pfeiffer's costume is one of the best Catwoman yeah. costumes ever I, made. I would say the best, because you've got the Batman... Uh, 66 Batman show. Uh, kind of classic comic booky style, you know. Anne Hathaway's Anne Hathaway's is real tech. I would say real tech, you know. I think it tried to be like sort of Arkham City or comic book Catwoman, yeah. but it kind of fell on its ass And then Because if you're going to do that, go the whole way with it. You know, like, ma- don't make her look like a cat. Gear the goggles, yeah, gear yeah. the outfit. We'll know who she is, do you know what I mean? Don't and then Catwoman with Halle Berry, which is just... You get two costumes... But the first costume was actually better than the second. Enough said. Let's <laughs> not. We've already discussed that shit. Let's not go there again. Penguin. Penguin. Fucking rags beautiful. Two riches, beautiful. Like, like rags to riches. He was just sitting there, like, and he did look like a penguin. You know, he had the bandages yes. on his arms. He had the on his hands to you know kind of keep his fingers together. He had the the tattered suit. Yep. You know, he was a mess. A bit of a slob. Like, r- it's kind of like onesie. Do you kinda. know who he looked like? Riff Raff a wee bit for There's Rocky Riff Horror. Yeah, the bu- the yeah, bit. yeah. Aye. 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 But, like, Penguin Soup was, like, much worse. Aye. But, like, aye, like, like that, you know, the r- if you're, th- you're trying to figure out what Danny DeVito looks like, imagine a midget Riff Raff for, for Rocky Horror, right? You won't regret it. Um, but, aye, that's, um, that's that. Yeah. I, I could probably look at that. Penguin was really good. Penguin really fit his character. A dishevelled man who was abandoned and he looked that way. He looked homeless, but he was a he, he was dangerous man. He yeah. was a danger. So definitely looking at that. Yep. And uh we're getting into one of our f- well, one of my favourite segments on the movie reviews, James. The that, budget. <laughs> yes, the budget. So Charlie Hair, the budget. Mm-hmm. Yes. For the budget. That was my Tory voice. This. I appreciate it. No, I'm sorry. I can't. The Tories can go suck a dick. I bet and I that line will be cut from the uh, podcast because <laughs> I do not want to get done. <laughs> so the budget for the movie, James, was estimated $80 million. And I have to guess how much it made? Yes. Okay, but you have to give me the hint. Did it make more? Okay. Did it, did it, it make its budget? It made its budget. Right, I had a feeling that it would. Yeah, because the last one was, uh, if I remember correctly, was about thirty million, thirty million estimated to make, and it c- clawed back what about three hundred and fifty? I want to say three hundred. Mm. Rings a bell. It rings a bell. So James, three guesses. Right. So, <coughs> so the budget was again estimated eighty million. Eighty million. Right. So I'm gonna assume four hundred and eighty million. No. Am I close? Mm-hmm. I can't say anything. Oh, I need to stay impartial for your other two choices. I know, but I want to know if I'm close. No, 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 no. Okay, I'll just say higher or lower. We'll play this game of higher or lower. Right, okay. Lower. Right, okay. Okay. It's in that region, I can tell. Uh, 40... F- 450 million? 450 million. Lower. Last one. Uh, Hold on, I'll try and trans. Four hundred. No, no, no! Before you talk, right, I'm, I'm putting the image, in my brain, and I'm transmitting it to your brain, right? Um. Right. Okay. But I'm. I'm gonna get this wrong. Four hundred and. <laughs> Thirty million. 
wrong. A hundred and sixty-two million. Seriously? Yes. The first film. Uh, was like I know. Te- like ten times, it's. I think it was about three hundred million. So it, about ten times. It got back. This only doubled. It still made its profit. Oh yeah, it, and, and and let's be honest. Put the two together, 110 million for the making, and that was what about maybe 500 million. So still, that's like five times that warrants the disasters that have yet that we have yet to review in Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Unfortunately, because of that 500 million, James, we got shit for two movies. I just don't understand that. Like I, I personally. Jack Nicholson is the best, jo- one of the best Jokers yes. who ever have played the character ever. Yep. Period. No argument. So it's understandable that you know when Batman first came out, you know it was going to be a big deal. You know, Tim Burton really big at the time. Yes. But how could Batman Returns not do it as well? Because I personally I don't know. prefer Batman Returns. So da. It's, it's got, got more story. It's got more development. A character. Better it's set got design. Yes. Much Which, better. Well, set it's design. it's sameish, but, but it it's is more better. Refined. It's more refined. Um, and you've got more overall Batman Returns has a lot more character in general. Yeah. So I don't know how. And and didn't I tell you that? How how do you feel with Bruce Wayne? Michael Keaton is Bruce Wayne. I said last time you'll probably feel different about him because there is more screen time, obviously, over two movies to develop into a character. Now, how did how did you feel with that? Mm, I still don't like him. Really? I, I, like, I think the first one was him trying to deal with the fact that he was confronting his parents' killer, so he was a bit mad. And this one, he just seems depressed. Yeah, because he's came out of... Um, we're we're led to believe that he's came out of a relationship with Vicky Vale. So everything that he's had before, he's caught yeah. and dealt with... Well, m- no so much caught, but dealt with his parents' killers, which initially birthed the whole torment and anger that he's had for years and now one person that the one person that he's maybe been able to rely to that's not alfred because let's be honest if he stuck his dick in alfred we'd all feel a little bit weird about it (laughs) oh no why would you put that image in my head because i'm a bastard james and now I've just said that you've put that image in my head and people are going to be like, oh my god, he's actually thinking about yes. that. What a fucking strange man. Well, guess You what? are a I, strange man. I, I am, right? And I don't mean it. He done it, right? Yeah, it was my fault. I hold my hand up to it. But Absolute yeah, prick. The, <laughs> the, one ca- the one person that he can rely on has basically abandoned him, probably going, you're too fucked up for my liking. So... He is a little bit depressed in this because... I think he played the more reserved and laid-back Bruce Wayne who is harbouring a lot of anger and a lot of rage, but I preferred them to the first film because the first film he was just acting mere mental. Yeah. You know, whereas this one, he was a lot more like, you know, Bruce Wayne that we would know, we'd come to see. Very Christian Bale Bruce Wayne, you know, very calm, reserved, man of very few words and relying on Alfred to get him out of, like, Sticky personal, situations. personal situations that he can't be asked dealing with. That, to me, was a lot better. I still... Is he... Is he, is he improved much? He, here's the thing. Of, like, I think... Out, a of wee what, bit, out of what you've seen of Ben Affleck and, obviously, Adam West stuff and you've seen Michael Keaton... Michael Keaton's two performances as Bruce Wayne and Batman. Out of those three... Because we'll, we'll get into uh, Forever and Batman and Robin. Trust me, we fucking will. <laughs> but out of those three kind of... Oh, and uh, Christian Bale. Mm-hmm. Out of those four actors, who would you say is the better for Bruce Wayne and Batman? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here, right? And I'm just going to call it for what it is and for what I've seen. Ben Affleck. And I'll tell you for why. Because Ben Affleck was by far the best thing about Batman vs. Superman. Oh, yes. Because he played the angry, calm, reserved Bruce Wayne, who's been through a lot more shit than Michael Keaton has, a lot more shit than Adam West well, went through, and a lot more shit than Christian Bale went through. You know, he lost a Robin, he's lost his family, probably had 
run-ins and scrapes with Catwoman, probably been through all that. He is the refined Batman, and Ben Affleck just plays it so well because he's no scared to break the rules. He's no scared to go that wee bit further. And I think Ben Affleck needs to be in the right film with the right script to really show us that he, that he is, you know, for that part. And I think he is. Honestly, I do. Um, that's just what I think about it, and I think he's brilliant. I'm still waiting to see him go against Jared Leto. Yeah. Cause I think that could redeem Jared Leto because the best Joker's at his best when he's gone against Batman. Of course, there's no argument there. So I want like to see that before Jared Leto or Ben Affleck spit the dummy. Okay. Because I think it could be good. What about yourself? Uh, I'm split with nostalgia and being realistic. <laughs> no, no, like. It plays a major part. Like that was for many years until they recast. Uh, was my Batman, Bruce uh, Michael Keaton. He was Bruce Wayne and Batman to me for years. So I would, I would say it's a split between Michael Keaton and Ben Affleck. Like uh, we've got Christian Bale, who's a more realistic Batman, and. Uh, Adam West, who's a campy, funny kind of style Batman, which you know th- they're they're all good in their own right, but I'm fifty fifty on it. Yeah, I personally think Ben Affleck. Yeah, he it, he it, it done everything that he could, but that's another Batman for another style time. movie. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Yeah. <laughs> same uh, bat time, same bat channel. Same and bat Glaswegian geeks. <laughs> and that is the it, end. Uh, no, 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 no. We never, you never, never. No, don't jump the fucking gun here. Out of ten. Out of ten. Yes. I'll give Batman Returns a good solid seven. Oh, you give Batman an eight if I remember correctly. Did I? I think you did. Because I gave it an eight as well, and I'm gonna go out on a fucking limb here and and say nine. Because I want to. I'm gonna give it a nine. Nine. But I'm gonna give it a nine actually because now that I think about it. It is. It, it's a superior movie to Batman. It's, like I said, it's got better character development. It shows progression of character. And the fact that they went as far as I'd say it's more fun. Yeah. I, obviously, Jack Nicholson made Batman the funnest movie it could possibly be. But with the inclusion of Catwoman, her split personality, and Penguin, who just has kind of. Penguin rags really to riches to fucking rags again was Penguin perfection. Penguin very much mirrored uh, Jack Nicholson's performance yeah. as the Joker. You know, he kept that humour, so which that was good. Catwoman kept it funny as well as in the way only Catwoman can, but still kept it grounded, and I think that's fantastic. I'll give it a nine for that, purely because everything about it is superior. Yes. And everything about it is good. So, you know, there's very little I find wrong with it, um, really, for yeah. a Batman movie. You know, it feels like a comic book. You know, it, it, this 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 is one of the, the very few films that gets Gotham right. And James, on that note, it's a farewell from us. Take it away. Well, <laughs> you have been listening to Glaswegian Geeks. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Get our podcast on YouTube. Some video content on there as well. Yes, yeah, so we'll be cloud. putting more and more video content up in the future, hopefully really soon, so stay tuned for that. And you've been listening to Glaswegian Jane Geeks, always remember that you can follow us on SoundCloud and iTunes, if you are, if you like this podcast and want to hear more, we've got tons more, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter, we're always looking for new people to join our merry squad and yes. let us know what you want to see, the room. you know, rate, review, subscribe and all that, Gaff, and we'll see you next time. So as always, if this has been the pussy you've been waiting for, geek out. Geek out, guys. <laughs> <laughs>